And the identification problem, I imagine, will concern us for not only today's talk, but also the following talk. What I shall do is, is to uh, basically, first of all, remind ourselves of the identification problem in econometrics and then discuss why the uh, standard criteria that one would use in econometrics break down in the presence of time series type of complications and go through some of the solutions that have been proposed to overcome that breakdown and finally try to relate the uh, identification material for econometric models to the <coughs> meanings that the word identification is given in various other applications. So what I want to do then is to first of all start with some general points. And so moving on to section three, identification uh, 3.1, I guess, generalities, rather than anything very specific. And the basic uh, definition, I suppose, one ought to give always uh, when starting to talk about identification and the one which I shall use is the following. I speak of a structure in the sense of implying a set of parameter values. OK, that is with, numer with numerically specified uh, values, that is. And the structure, of course, belongs to a model, which is simply a set of such numerically specified structures. This is identified, and we are, of course, generally speaking, in terms of numerical parameter values, Oops. Um, if there is no other structure which is observationally equivalent. And so the basic notion on which we shall be depending is simply that of observational equivalence. And by this, various different things uh, are meant, depending upon how, how much detail one wants to give. Um, in some situations, it's enough to say that two structures are, are observationally equivalent if they generate the same uh, second moments. In other situations, observational equivalence is used in terms of the actual probability density function of the observations. Um, and so the, the, the stronger definition, which is used in this um, classic econometric literature, would be to say that this, these are observationally equivalent. In other words, they have, I should say, have the same PDF of the observations. OK. Well, now, the basic ideas, um, when applied to the standard econometric model, if we, st if we consider the, what we now should distinguish as a static model of the usual form, beta y plus gamma z is ut, and we assume that u t is uh, independent over time. And so if we look at the covariances, both contemporaneous and lagged, we would say that these are certainly non-zero contemporaneously. We allow cross-equation correlation among these disturbances, but we do not allow any serial correlation to give us the standard version of the simultaneous equations model in which the uh, usual identifiability conditions are derived. Well, now, if, if we start out with a probability density function for these disturbances, so p if, if, say, the PDF of u t, say, is some function which depends upon the covariances, then we can simply use the uh, 
model as specified to transform from the u's to the endogenous variables y and write down the probability associated with a given sample of observations on the endogenous variables. And so uh, if we think about a random sample of size capital T of observations on the endogenous variables, conditional on, say, predetermined variables and uh, coefficients, then this, by the standard uh, transformation type procedures, will simply give us a probability density function involving the Jacobian and a product of this particular form, which we can write basically like that. And that also is conditional on sigma. And then in there, there's a dyt. So basically, we have this sort of a setup. Um, now, the point then is that any new structure that we might obtain from the old by taking linear combinations of equations, so the new structure, say, FBYT plus F gamma ZT equals FUT, this has exactly the same probability density function for the observations, and so is basically, in terms of our earlier notion of observationally equivalent, observationally indistinguishable from the original structure, that is, for any non-singular transformation matrix F. And so that... Uh, let's say, has the same PDF of the observations for F, non-singular, I should say. Uh, and let's say so, so is observationally equivalent. And this basically is the, so is the source of the uh, identification problem for an econometric model. That is, if we simply say that the model contains a bunch of relationships describing how a set of endogenous variables are determined in terms of a set of exogenous variables, and nothing more than that, then basically we have this uh, problem that uh, the data are not going to be terribly informative about the details of that particular structural representation, since we can take, on multiplying through by this tra non-singular transformation matrix F, in effect, we can take any linear combination of the equations of the system and replace each equation one by one by such arbitrary linear combinations, and the resulting new structure will be observationally indistinguishable from what we originally wrote down. Well, now, of course, the way in which we resolve this problem is to put conditions upon the original model, that is, impose restrictions on the, in, in general, on the B and gamma matrices, such that it is not possible for a new structure, F, B, F, gamma, and so on, to satisfy those restrictions if F is anything other than the unit matrix. Oh, OK. Mm. Like so? Yeah? What? <laughs> no, no repeats. This, this is in order to pick up the heartbeats. When you ask a question, I get excited. <laughs> OK. Uh, so where were we?
Um, okay, then we have these uh, transformations there. What I should also say, I guess, is that um, these are observationally equivalent. I should also say that the new structure has the, exactly the same reduced form as the old structure. Maybe that was something I didn't include. Um, let's say, so continue that sentence then, and has the same reduced form. Um, which would be, of course, simply obtained by looking at pi as uh, Fb inverse F gamma, which is, of course, just B inverse minus B inverse gamma. <coughs> and the other point is that uh, to which all these structures are observationally equivalent. Um, in other words, if you take F equals B inverse, you'll see that. So, in effect, what we can say, an alternative way of putting the problem, is that there is one reduced form, which we could expect the data to give us, or the data to consistently estimate, and any linear combination of the specified structure uh, is observationally equivalent <laughs> to that single reduced form. Well, now, as I was saying, we would typically solve the problem by imposing restrictions or remove this indeterminacy by imposing restrictions. But that's like the point, isn't it? I mean, you've got to show that if two structures are observationally equivalent, then they satisfy the transformation. Yeah, I haven't done that. Um, right, what I need to show is that uh, the, the class of observationally equivalent structures is, is entirely generated by transformation of this form. Yeah, that can be done. But you're quite right, it hasn't been done. Um, that's, yes, that is important because if, uh, if I devised a procedure for resolving the difficulty in terms of linear combinations of equations, and yet it was also possible by some other device, nonlinear combinations of one form or another, to generate observationally equivalent structures, the procedures I would have developed would not be sufficient. Uh, so what in fact is needed is, to, is a statement that um, uh, not only does a structure of this form have the same PDF of the observations, this is the, but that this is the only way in which I can generate structures which have the same probability and density function of the observations. Um, okay, the problem is solved by restricting B and gamma, or maybe I should simply say more generally at the moment, restricting the model. So that um, the uh, transformed model solves, satisfies these restrictions only if the transformation matrix is the unit matrix. In other words, only if there is only uh, a single structure in effect among the class of observationally equivalent structures which satisfies the restrictions imposed on the model do we have an identified situation. Can you add one yeah. point? When you say a static model, is it um, truly a static model? <coughs> or is that the ZTs don't contain any lambdas? Uh, because it seems to me that if it is that case, then you have to look at conditions on the ZTs. Yes, it's true. Could have there are pure which wouldn't uh, excite the system. Yes. Um, in fact, in most of the discussions of the, of the uh, sort of classical form, this uh, there can be lagged variables in here as long as this thing is maintained, basically. Actually, the discussion comes out much better, you know, from the general s analysis of the situation when you've got lags in there. But you know, most of the econometric literature does. Allow for lags in the, in the, in the, among the Zs. That's right. But, you know, but when you Basically, what we need in, in practice, uh, the way in which the discussion goes at any rate, are conditions upon the, uh, the elements of the Z 
vector um, and the elements of the u vector such that multivariate least squares estimates, estimates of that form, will be consistent in, in the reduced form. So that basically you can, get, you can get out the reduced form consistently by standard least squares procedures. That would be the uh, <coughs> sort of conditions which would normally be imposed. Actually, usually in econometric literature, uh, you don't find conditions like the things that Peter refers to. That's, tr that's right. That's, uh, well, that's quite correct. That excites <laughs> me, but uh, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can, in fact, uh, frame your analysis you know, well, uh, just arrange, arrange test analysis a little bit to cater for that. Just wait. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, okay. So basically, what we do then is to impose restrictions upon typically the B, beta, and gamma matrices, such that a transformed uh, structure will not satisfy those restrictions, uh, or what one might say, such that a transformed structure is not, to use one of the terms, is not model admissible. The uh, necessary condition, or a necessary condition, is of course that based upon the number of such restrictions necessary, so a necessary condition basically is that each equation of the model uh, is subject to at least g minus 1 linear homogeneous restrictions. Together with a normalization rule, so we ought to say plus normalization, and the typical restrictions that are found in practice are not these relatively general linear homogeneous restrictions, but simply the restriction that a coefficient in a particular equation takes a zero value. Um, so let's say typically zero restrictions are employed. Which is simply a way of saying that the information we have is that particular variables in the endogenous or exogenous variable vector do not enter particular equations. And this argument is usually based on some economic theory. In effect, it's an implicit argument <coughs> more than an explicit argument because typically we would say that if a particular equation of this model represented a particular economic agent's behavior or represented a particular sector of the economy, we would have based our inclusion of variables on some particular theory, which said that, for example, certain groups of variables were relevant. And the, the uh, exclusion argument, then it seems to me, is somewhat implicit in that. We say, well, uh, the household consumer behavior depends upon the following equations. Sorry, it depends upon the following variables. And by implication, does not depend upon these remaining variables. And so we would typically get our exclusions in that way. And so it always seems to me to be a slightly strong statement to say, well, typically our zero restrictions are based on economic theory. What is based on economic theory is what, what goes into the equation, less, not, and not so much, it seems to me, what, what is left out. OK, well, now, that's the, uh, that's the standard, th standard stuff. Now let's look at a dynamic um, model. I should finally say, of course, that this is incomplete. Uh, this we would recognize as an order condition, uh, a necessary condition. And of course, there is a necessary and sufficient condition, uh, the rank condition, uh, which I shall not, which I shall assume we all know about. OK. Let's look at a dynamic model, possibly with autocorrelated errors. And so I shall just write B of L and gamma of L in place of the original 
B and gamma matrices. Xt, as before, is purely exogenous variables. And I'll use the same symbol ut for the disturbances, but I basically am now going to relax the condition of the previous con discussion that these things are independent over time. OK, so this then is the form in which um, I w I've already discussed uh, some aspects of this particular um, behavior. Basically, now, the point is that the standard conditions, for example, the conditions which I discussed a moment ago, are inadequate for identification of the more general model of this form, basically because we can generate observationally equivalent structures by doing rather different things from what we did in the original situation. That is, we can generate observationally equivalent structures by replacing the matrix F of the original discussion by another lag polynomial matrix. And so in this case, the class of observationally equivalent structures is broader. So we can generate observationally equivalent structures by using a lag polynomial transformation matrix. where again the uh, transformation matrix is non-singular. The point is that all such structures have the same final form. So if we use the corresponding notion to the notion of the equivalence through the reduced form uh, that I mentioned a little while ago, then the notion is based upon the, uh, the final form in this case. So let's simply say these all have final form, just to remind you what that is. Y2 is just the solution. Based upon uh, generalization of the previous reduced form type solution. Now, in, th in the uh, previous case, that is in the static model, or as it were, the classical theory, the possibility of transformations based upon a lag polynomial matrix is in effect ruled out by the requirement that the error term is non-autocorrelated. So, in fact, uh, although it, it, it's not usually made explicit in discussions of necessary and sufficient conditions, and so on, that uh, the independence of the disturbance term plays a crucial role. Clearly, in this particular case, th this assumption of independence does play a crucial role in restricting the class of admissible transformations to generate observationally equivalent structures. Okay. In effect, what we're doing in, this p in, the, in the basic framework is ruling out the possibility of including combinations of equations at different lags by saying that the error terms in the original structure are independent or not correlated one with another. And hence, if we do introduce combinations of equations at different points in time, the resulting linear combination of lagged equations will have a disturbance term which is itself uh, autocorrelated. And so, in effect, then, the independence assumption in the standard framework is what rules out the admissibility of lag polynomial transformation matrices. Once we abandon that assumption, however, and also include different uh, lags in here, then clearly uh, we, we are quite uh, able to, uh, to do that. And the simple demonstration is to say, well, clearly, whatever lag combination of the equations we take, 
we end up always with the same final form. And so observational equivalence then, through the final form, uh, generates a much broader class of structures. And so we would expect to have to impose somewhat uh, more substantial restrictions in order to, again, reduce the only possible transformation that is in some sense admissible to the unit matrix. Um, I could be working through the likelihood if you want. I'll stick to uh, I'll stick to uh, co covariances for the moment. Okay. Second moments will do the trick. All right. Um, okay. I'll, another way of looking at the problem again is exactly analogous to the to one of the ways in which the uh, <coughs> problem is put in the static case. That is, when we say, given a reduced form, can we uniquely deduce structural parameters from it? In this case, we might say, given this final form coefficient um, matrix, can we uniquely deduce the elements beta of L and gamma of L from that? So again, is there a, a unique factorization of that uh, particular final form coefficient matrix? OK, so the problem then is to it remains the same. Um, so let's just, let me just write down what that is. Problem is. Uh, to ensure that f of l, um, let's say, can only be the unit matrix, or, or in other words, to ensure that there is a unique factorization of this final form coefficient, so in other words, of uh, B of L inverse gamma of L. Well, now, an obvious possibility that might occur straight away in order to restrict the class of possible transformations, F of L, one obvious possibility might simply be to specify what the degrees of the lag polynomials in the original structure actually might be. So in other words, if we could do that, uh, it might seem that we would restrict the possible transformations. And so let me just mention this briefly to specify the uh, degrees uh, which I previously think I called R and S of these uh, polynomials. Just that maybe I should remind, let me remind ourselves what it is. And uh, the point then is that if we multiply these polynomials by some general polynomial matrix F of L, then typically we would expect that the degrees of the resulting product would be increased. OK. Multiplication by F of L in general. Of course, as always, it's the departures from the in general that are the interesting cases. Uh, in general, increases these. And if that is so, and we have specified these maximum degrees, the transformed structures will be inadmissible. So this would seem to be one way out of the uh, problem. And it is, in fact, an approach which has been employed uh, in some of the
papers that I shall be looking at in more detail, you might say on the face of it, it seems somewhat unrealistic, given what goes on in practical econometric model building, insofar as specifying the dynamics is concerned, which is to say that it is usually uh, data-based, hit and miss, empirical ad hoc um, procedure, rather than one which is uh, based on an economic theory, which says, well, yes, the economic theory tells us what the values of these actual uh, quantities act, uh, is for a given model. Nevertheless, I guess one would say that if that once one has armed oneself with the relevant identification conditions, it still is essential to check that for any particular pair of values of these degrees which one is contemplating, the resulting model is in fact identified. Well now, as I say, the, the, uh, the, uh, this approach is one which uh, is used, that is to specify these degrees and then see what else is necessary. It turns out that this does not, in fact, provide a complete solution to the problem. And that is what uh, the papers by uh, Hannon, which I've given on the list, demonstrate in the context of a moving average error specification. That is, if one assumes that the error disturbance ut is generated by a vector moving average process, also with known, of known order, so we're now assuming not only are, are the maximum degrees in beta and gamma known, but also the order of the moving average error is known, it turns out that the specification of those orders is in itself not sufficient to solve the particular problem. Um, what I want to do, look at first, however, is the autoregressive case, because that in some way is a little bit more traditional in its approach, or let's say by using a, traditional, a more traditional approach, one can still demonstrate <coughs> the existence of difficulties once degrees have been specified, and uh, in many ways I find that pos possibly more uh, accessible argument to give, or let's say a framework in which a more accessible argument can be given. Um, okay, so what I want to do first, maybe I can leave that as it stands, is to look at this autoregressive error specification and demonstrate the existence of problem problems even when the degrees of the polynomials in effect are specified and indicate how one may or may not be able to overcome those problems. Okay, so uh, let's start a new section. Uh, so, just to summarize my immediately preceding remarks, I'm going to use a direct solution approach, in effect. And the basic uh, objective is to, uh, to uh, illustrate the need for additional conditions. I shall take a very simple case, and when you've seen how complicated that is, maybe you'll appreciate why I stick to a simple case. All right, the structural form, I can abbreviate that to SF, structural form I'll take is the static model with almost the minimum possible complication, that is, a single lag in the endogenous variable vector. And we'll assume no lags in x to keep it simple. <coughs> and as I've indicated initially, I'm going to take an autoregressive error specification. Okay, so that's the structure. And 
as I said uh, a moment ago, I'm, going, I'm assuming that the lag specification is known. That is, that we know that uh, there is just this one period lag on an endogenous variable appearing in any equation, no lags on exogenous variables, and also we know that this is the error specification, namely just a first order autoregression. Okay, the reduced form of this system, uh, in the usual way, we can write, write out what that is, making the solution B0 inverse B1 yt. Um, B0 inverse gamma xt uh, plus error term. And let me define these matrix coefficient matrices by using the standard reduced form symbol as pi 1 and pi 2. And likewise, using the standard reduced form symbol for the disturbance term, we'll call that vt. And vt, again, of course, being based upon the structural disturbance ut, which is first order autoregressive, vt itself is first order autoregressive. vt, we might say, is equal to, say, s, vt minus 1, plus some disturbance of a white noise kind, e to t, and uh, s is b naught inverse R B naught. Got those? Yes, they are the right way around. And uh, e to t is the same transformation B zero inverse of the structural innovation disturbance term innovations. Okay, so that's the reduced form then. Um, now, as far as consistent estimation by some standard least squares procedure is concerned, what we would in practice do is make some autoregressive transformation of the reduced form. And so let's do that. If we then apply the transformation which is a matrix generalization of the standard autoregressive transformation, standard cochrane orcutt type operation, that is, multiply the uh, reduced form equation by the autoregressive matrix S, lag it one period and subtract. The result will be an error term on the resulting transformed equation, which is simply e to t, this independent uh, vector white noise process. And so the, uh, the uh, so-called transformed <coughs> reduced form that would result from that is simply yt is equal to pi 1 plus s yt minus 1 minus s pi 1 yt minus 2 uh, plus gamma xt minus s gamma xt minus 1 plus e to t. OK. The final version I need is an unrestricted version of this equation. which I shall just write in some general notation, um, implicitly defining the associated, the, the corresponding matrices. So let's just call this, say, P1, P2, P3, P4. I would normally regard the, this last equation as, in effect, the uh, corresponding relationship to the reduced form in the static case. 
That is to say, we would say that the uh, one way of putting the problem would be to say that this, the information about this equation is what is given to us by the data. And so as in the static case, we sometimes would regard the a perfectly known reduced form and the set of data as in effect being the same thing for identification purposes. Likewise, in this case, we, would, we could similarly assume that it's from these particular coefficient matrices that we began. Well, now, in this particular context, then, the first problem is, given these coefficient matrices, P1 through P4, can we uniquely deduce pi 1, pi 2, and S? I'm sorry, I've got my, some wrong notation somewhere, isn't there? I know it's early in the morning, but somebody might have shouted. Somebody should have shouted. Pi 2, that is there. You were running a little book on how long it would take, <laughs> take me to notice. Uh, OK. Given the P's then, P1 through P4, the question is, first question, can we uniquely deduce pi 1, pi 2, and S from that? If that can be done, then of course there is the standard identification problem over here. That is, having got pi 1 and pi 2, can we get beta 0, beta 1, and gamma from that? So in a sense, wh what this indicates is that there may be uh, an additional identification problem prior to the standard argument. The standard argument, I would say, simply being that of, imp that of uh, deducing unique estimates for beta naught, beta 1, and gamma from estimates of pi 1 and pi 2. And so let's consider then this prior problem, how one might go about um, doing that. Well, now, the, a simple way to, a simple place to look initially is, of course, at the coefficients of the exogenous variables in this particular uh, formulation, comparing the unrestricted and the restricted coefficient estimates. Because if we simply uh, identify, as it were, pi 2 with p3 and s pi 2 with p4, it could well be that we can get out of that a unique solution for s. And if we can get a unique solution for s out of that pair of relationships, then a solution for pi 1 will follow from the pair of relationships over here. And so if we first look at that um, situation, then if the, uh, let's say, the equation uh, obtained by equating coefficients of xt and xt minus 1, is, say, uh, s p3 plus p4 equals 0. Uh, if this can be solved for S, then the, basically the problem is over. Uh, and the condition for that is that the rank of the P3 matrix be G, the number of rows. Or in other words, that P3 be a full rank. So if P3 has rank G, then what we can do in this case is uh, solve for S. And uh, unique estimates of the remaining coefficients follow. So let's send unique um, solutions for pi 1 and pi 2 follow. So in effect, this immediately provides a uh, sufficient condition for identification in addition to the standard rank conditions. That is, if this condition is satisfied, if P3 has rank G, then the initial identification problem, that is identification, as it were, of the reduced form in the original, in, in the version over there, is, uh, is solved. And having then solved that problem, got to 
that has got to this particular stage, a standard rank condition would enable the final step to be made. And so we could think then of this particular condition, this matrix P3 having full rank, as being a sufficient condition augmenting the usual uh, rank condition. Of course, one way in which uh, that uh, breaks down is if the number of exogenous variables is less than g. So let's say we could equally say a necessary condition for P3 to have rank g is that there be at least g elements in this exogenous variable vector. Uh, let's note that. Now notice that this is a statement about the exogenous variable vector, and we're not talking about uh, any lagged endogenous variables or predetermined variables at all. We're, we mean genuine exogenous variables in this case. Now, if, uh, if this model is of any size, you might expect, in, in typical macroeconometric models at any rate, that this condition might well not be met. Of course, usually the large macro model uh, achieves its identification in effect, or let's say, in effect makes most of the equations over-identified by the static type of condition by putting lagged endogenous variables in a few equations and excluding them from all the others. Of course, every time you include a lagged value in one equation, um, implicitly, if you introduce it in only one equation, there's one more restriction on all the other equations of the model. And so in terms of the static conditions, it's in this setting that most large macro models are substantially over-identified. The point to note here is we're not talking about that. What we're talking about are the purely exogenous variables, and this seems to be saying we need at least as many exogenous variables as endogenous. Now, the, uh, the presumption is that, by and large, that would not be satisfied. And so we need to look at what else has to be done. Um, there is one proviso which I ought to make finally, just checking my notes before leaving this statement, um, I need to exclude those which are redundant when lagged. Um, i.e., which cause dependencies between xt and xt minus 1. So, for example, a simple linear trend uh, is of that variety, seasonal dummy variables, and so on. Um, a simple analogy is the scalar case uh, in this, for this particular problem. Suppose, just as, a, as an aside. What, what, do you, what do you do with uh, things that uh, are dependent? Do, do you explicitly show the dependence and shove them back into the equation? I mean, x t yeah. minus 1 was. Yeah. You see, the thing is, the question basically is, you know, you've got a, you've got a bunch of variables in here, yeah. you've lagged them there, and we're, going to, we're, we're implicitly assuming that we can freely estimate this equation. Mm. So, sure. so, so, you, you so I'm wanting to remove exact collinearity between these two vectors. Not by class, but by substituting. Yeah. yeah. In effect, you, you, it's as if you wait, you replace a coefficient by 1 minus something times that coefficient. It's just a scaling effect, that's all. Um, if, if we look at the scalar case, going back to uh, quite simple things, 
No, uh, no bolt face symbols. No wiggly underlining. Uh, with a first order uh, auto aggressive error. Then what we know is that the. Uh, if we look at the equation that most of us would use to estimate this thing, then, in effect, it's this equation. And uh, as an exercise, no doubt we've all programmed this at some stage or other of our careers. And, uh, Basically, we would estimate that thing by nonlinearly squares. That is, we would minimize the residual sum of squares of this equation subject to beta rho and gamma, subject to the implied <coughs> constraint. And that, that's fine. Um, we can do that, no problems at all, as long as x is actually here. Once you remove xt, we're in trouble because Although we can certainly estimate it, we can no longer uniquely identify beta and rho. So if we estimate this last equation by nonlinear least squares, okay, we shall get estimates of coefficients for yt minus 1, yt minus 2, from which we cannot unscramble the two coefficients uniquely. Sorry, I thought you were giving me a different symbol, signal. All right, so the condition here then is that uh, to be identified, the one equation model needs one exogenous variable, which is exactly the same as uh, we're saying up here. That's under general assumptions about the structure, because clearly there's specific assumptions about the structure less than uh, G inputs could excite the system sufficiently yeah. to estimate. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, you what sort of assumption? I mean, what, what do you have in mind in here, well, for example, in this case? Well, in the, in the single input case, it, it's o it o is obviously the case because you haven't got an input at all. But if right. you've got a multivariable, oh, okay. less than G right. inputs can excite yes. the system. Yes, it's true. Oh, less yes, less than G can do it. Just wait, wait. This is only sufficient condition. After all. No, I, I was just, you know, since I think the analogy tends to imply that... Uh, you that know, it can't be done at all. Done. Yes, I'm sorry. It, I, I didn't want to carry, uh, carry that over uh, simply to illustrate that there is a simple analogy with which we're possibly familiar. Now, if, uh, if that isn't true, then uh, we have to do something else. Then to obtain S, we look at the uh, remaining uh, coefficients. That is, the coefficients involving the lags in, in Y. <coughs> So let's uh, look at the coefficients of lagged y. If we simply equate those two sets of coefficients, that is, p1 is, we hope, going to yield estimates of pi 1 plus s. p2 is going to yield, we hope, unique estimates of s pi 1. Then if we equate, make the uh, equations, and eliminate pi 1 from that pair of relationships, we shall get an equation in S. And the question is then, finally, whether that can be solved uniquely. Um, so if we, uh, if we do that, look at the coefficients of yt, the resulting equation for S is simply S squared minus SP1 minus P2 equals zero. Now this is uh, a quadratic equation in the matrix, in the G by G matrix S, and it may have, in general it will have, uh, multiple solutions. Um, so the quadratic may have 
um, as many as 2G CG solutions I should say that is a, that's the maximum number of solutions that this equation can have let's call them say SI and uh, see what happens well now if only one of them satisfies the original equation That is uh, the equation relating the x coefficients, sp3 plus p4 equals 0. Then, in effect, the problem is finished. Then s is determined, clearly, and so are the pi's. In that situation, then, that only one of these multiple solutions satisfied the relationship involving the x coefficients, we would say that the model was identified. If more than one satisfy this equation, then the possibility, of course, is that we have, well, it's not a possibility, we have multiple reduced form solutions. The possibility remains, however, that only one of those reduced form solutions will give structural estimates satisfying the structural restrictions, in which case the model is still identified. However, that may not be true. There may still be multiple solutions for the actual structural form, and we would end up with an unidentified situation. Um, so let's say that if more than one SI satisfies this relationship, then we have multiple reduced form solutions. Identification situation is, of course, the, in, the one in which there may be uh, only one solution for the uh, B naught B one gamma subject to restrictions. Uh, but, of course, multiple solutions are possible. Now, the point about this setup is that you will see there are no general conditions that, have get the, that are being applied. We're talking about the situation in which there is inadequate, as it were, exogenous variables in the model and the way in which the question is being determined is by basically chasing through the solution. Uh, OK. Yeah, I'll take a break now.
I put up all the details for anyone who has the same taste for mindless arithmetic that I have. Okay, uh, basically these are two observation equivalent structures. The uh, model is a two equation model with two endogenous variables. That is only one exogenous variable in the system, that is the matrix gamma has only a single column. And so we are in the situation in which the number of exogenous variables is less than the number of endogenous variables. On the face of it, the equations are just identified by the standard static type of condition because the zero in the B1 matrix, I'm assuming, is a prior restriction. So in other words, if you ignored the complications which have been the subject of most of this lecture, you would conclude that these equations uh, were identified. That is, they satisfy the usual order condition. Nevertheless, these two structures are in, do in fact generate the same uh, transformed reduced form. Um, notice that uh, the coefficients are in fact reasonably similar. That is to say, if one had prior beliefs about the magnitudes of these structural parameters, in terms of, for example, whether they were positive or negative, whether they were greater than one or less than one, or s and so forth, then both structures in that situation are somewhat similar. That is, uh, in terms of the signs of the coefficients, where they are relative to uh, being greater than one or less than one, these things are moderately similar. Nevertheless, the point is that they each lead to clearly distinct local maxima of the relevant likelihood function. So basically what we have here is a situation in which the, if, we want, if we were using, for example, a full information maximum likelihood type estimator, the estimator has two, the, the likelihood function has two peaks. One corresponding to one solution, the other corresponding to the other solution, and these are distinct. Uh, in practice, you might hope that if, the, if we were going to be in this situation, you might hope that uh, in more realistic situations, let's say in non-artificial situations, the coefficients might be such that only one of your possible solutions was acceptable. You, know, you, you might hope that if this were one correspondent to one <coughs> local maximum of the likelihood function, the solution corresponded to a second local maximum was patently silly, like having negative propensities or coefficients greater than one when they should be less than one and so on, which would enable you to home in using that prior information as well, home in on one particular solution. So in a sense this may be a little artificial in the, to the extent that it does make the coefficients look quite similar. And in practice one might hope that additional prior information would enable you to pick out one solution as opposed to the other. In this sort of thing, there, there usually is a whole family of observation equivalent to this. There may be. In this case, there are only two. There are only two. In this yeah. Case. See, do, in this case, 2GCG is six. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there may be six reduced form solutions. Yeah. But of those, in fact, there are only five. Uh, of those five, only two satisfy the prior restrictions which I'm taking for this example to be these things here, okay? It may be that only one do, does, okay? In which case, you're home and dry, there's no problem. It may be that, that in some situations all five do. And there is, uh, it seems difficult to give any prior guidance on that. You've just got to churn through and see. Or in terms of estimation, assuming the number of parameters is not too great, 
uh, 10 in this case, <laughs> you've got to let your procedure range pretty far and wide. The one example we know of is an eight equation model which uh, David Hendry uses as uh, his standard uh, test bed. Um, in, he has a, an econometrica article where he's used an eight equation model of the UK for, as, a, as a framework in which to illustrate the performance of various estimation and diagnostic procedures. He estimates it subject to vector autoregression. Um, you won't find it discussed in the article, but in fact, there have been two solutions for that, two uh, local maxima of the likelihood function for that model found. That is the one he gives in the paper and another one found subsequently. <laughs> Fortunately, in that case, the other one is just silly. You know, it, it, some of the coefficient values are just plainly ridiculous in terms of the economic meaning of the model, and so you would reject it. So what, for different starting values on your iteration? You can, you can find it. One. You can find it, yeah. It's being, that problem is now being used as a test of algorithms. See whether, see how quickly the, an algorithm will find you the other solution. Um, well, maybe the last thing I should say then, apart from, uh, in case one is, in case anybody is tempted by this example, maybe the last thing I should discuss, on the assumption that we haven't all gone closely through McDuffie, is uh, how one sets out solving this particular equation. So. Uh, this will be, as it were, a, a, t a ten minute digression from econometrics into, into uh, matrix algebra. The procedure is as follows. So let's say to obtain solutions of S squared um, minus S P1 P2 equals zero. Um, the first thing is to consider the equivalent scalar equation, so lambda squared i minus lambda p1 minus p2 determinant, that, and call that f of lambda. Basically, the matrix S will satis satisfy this uh, scalar equation. <coughs> And we need the solutions to it. Um, let's say solutions are determined by those in canonical form. And so basically what we need are matrices lambda i capital lambda obtained by taking little g of the 2g roots of f of lambda equals naught. And so this is where, this is basically where the, uh, <coughs> the multiple solution problem comes from. That is, we are looking for a g by g matrix, which we construct from its canonical form. Uh, in choosing a canonical form, we need only g roots of the associated equation. In fact, the associated equation in this case has two g roots. And so we can form, clearly, at most, assuming the roots are all distinct, uh, 2G, C, G, such lambda I matrices. Well, now, having done that, or having got all those, then it's simply a matter of going back to construct the S matrix. Um, the, uh, so if we get the lambda i's, we would say the solution S i is then of the form 
Um, say, actually, where do I have it? H i inverse lambda i h i. So in effect, we want to we want to um, eigenvector type matrix. H i non singular, of course. And so if we substitute into the original equation, the original quadratic, um, premult by HI, then what we get is the following, lambda i squared h i minus lambda i h i p1 minus h i p2 is equal to 0, and that can be solved for h. And so having got HI, there's your S solution. That's it. Um, usually, of course, bearing in mind what, uh, what function this HI matrix serves, um, <coughs> this, this final step can be solved for HI up to a normalization. But that is irrelevant when it comes to forming S, simply because we're using HI and its inverse up here. OK, so that's how you do it. Now, if anyone is tempted <laughs> by these carefully chosen numbers to, uh, to try it, let me give a hint. This, my assumption that a hint is necessary <coughs> is based on the fact that nobody's yet brought the moving average solution back to me. Um, OK, so in my example, the, uh, this determinant expression, I'll tell you what that is lambda squared i minus lambda p1 minus p2 uh, does, in fact, have four distinct roots. And they're nice numbers to play with. And so there could well be, since we do have these four distinct roots, there could well be six solutions for S. Clearly, if, if there were any repeated roots, then the number of distinct solutions would obviously be, would, would obviously be reduced. Um, but in this case, we have distinct roots, so there may be six. In fact, one of the solutions produces a singular H matrix, and so in fact, there are only five. So for one of the, one of the combinations of these roots, uh, the H matrix that comes out of here is singular, and so in fact, um, what I was saying in answer to a previous question is that there are, there are only five different, as it were, reduced form solutions. Sorry, five different S solutions. And only two of those satisfy the relationships involving the Xs. So there are two reduced form solutions, but both of those satisfy the prior restrictions on the structure. So that, let's say that, um, that's true. Um, let's say one HI is singular, hence only five S solutions. OK, so that, that, as I say, just to emphasize the start of the, the, the uh, start of the problem, uh, then it's a matter of seeing whether there are multiple solutions for the pi's, and subsequently, if there are, whether there are multiple solutions for the betas. And as far as I'm aware, no one yet has anything other than this uh, brute force and ignorance approach to the problem, problem. of identification of this model. Problem. 
Right. But the identification is very easy. Do you think that's easy? No, but that's not, well, that's, I want to answer it, but that's not the way to do it. <laughs> okay, well, what I want to do next, and probably uh, won't start in the last five minutes, is to go through the, uh, the moving average case. So maybe I'll save that until next time and stop here. Thank you.